Welcome to the Early Childhood Development in a Time of Pandemic webinar series. This uh, series has been facilitated by Isabel Vinay. She's an expert in the prevention of disruptive behaviors during early childhood and the executive director at CEECD. Uh, for today's webinar, I'm again delighted to welcome Brian Harrison from the Science of Early Childhood Development. Uh, I'd, I'd like to invite Isabel to introduce Brian and give the context for today's presentation as well. Isabel, over to you. So yes, this is our last uh, meeting together. Thank you all for being here. It's so such a warm day and you are inside and uh, there, so we are very happy. So this is our, yes, the last round of the uh, of that uh, webinar series. So uh, we're gonna be yeah, addressing brain development um, and yeah, addressing the context over uh, the specific context we are under, um, we are living right now. So we are pleased today to welcome again, uh, Brian Harrison from Red River College, Manitoba. You know, uh, the science of early child development uh, has a e-learning platform hosted at Red River College. And uh, it, it is, uh, 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 sorry, um, the science of our late child development and Red River College are partners uh, with Families Canada and the Encyclopedia in our uh, early child development uh, science to practice project. So um, happy to welcome Brian. He has been an educator working with people from toddlers to adults for the last 30 years. Uh, is currently a member of the research faculty and the health science and community department at Red River College in Winnipeg. We are very, very happy to welcome you, Brian. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it really is a pleasure to be here. The main message that I'm going to discuss today related to uh, early brain development is really quite simple. And it's basically two things. One is that the early years, the uh, early the period of early childhood education is one that we know from research and there's a lot more research every day coming out and you can learn about more of that in science of ECD. Um, it's an it's incredible period of rapid brain development, very significant brain development. So it's important period in terms of brain development. But what I'm going to suggest is for us, it can be a fairly simple way to respond to that important period. And that would be just making human connections, just being there. Um, we, we talked about play in our last webinar, and that's, that's certainly a key point as well. And I'll bring up that a little bit more today. But if we let the, um, the perspective of human connections and human relationships and just being there and communicating and being with children, if that's our guiding um, perspective, we're going to be doing just fine in terms of what children need in terms of brain development during this very important period of their lives. So early brain development is the topic and that's a huge topic. I'm not going to be going too much into the, uh, the depth of the science here. There's plenty of places to check that out, including the Encyclopedia on Early Child Development and on our Science of Early Child Development. We've got tons of stuff. A lot of the latest information about brain development and other aspects of uh, early childhood education. And it's, ve it's uh, very well laid out, er easy to follow. I will put some links to Science of ECD and some of the other things that I discuss in the chat box at the end of the, our session, so it'll make it easy for you to grab some of this stuff. So I am a, um, a research faculty with uh, Red River College, uh, but my background is an early childhood educator, so I'm an ECE. I've also been an ECE instructor, but now as I say, a lot of it's just kind of doing stuff on the computer. But I'm gonna largely come across from an ECE perspective, backed up with some useful science from the science of ECD. But to set the tone, I just wanted to share something from my ECE background. And it, um, it I think it really fits this idea of just using humanity and human relationships to support brain development as well as pretty much everything else that children need in terms of support, in terms of development. So when I worked in daycare, 
and it was a number of years ago, one of my favorite shifts was always the early shift. And there was always periods when seven o'clock and you'd have lots of children, lots of families coming in. It was very busy. But there was also times, probably more often, when people would come in a little bit more slowly. So the morning could be a little more relaxed. So I'd have time to set up an interesting environment. But I also really liked to have some kind of breakfast snack going on. So we would often have porridge for the children. So they could come in and a little bit hungry because who, who eats in the morning, especially when you're a little one. So when you when they come in first thing, it's kind of nice to have a little porridge, nice warm porridge to eat. Sometimes we would make biscuits. And so it might be me at seven o'clock with one or two other children and I bring the supplies out. Of course, we'd sanitize the table and we'd wash our hands. Let's Let's not make any mistakes here. But putting those supplies out and then we just casually make biscuits together and then we would have those biscuits to eat and when new children come in they could have a biscuit or the porridge if we're using porridge having porridge and parents would come in and say good morning would you like a biscuit would or would you like some porridge as well and children would come in some would be very shy and very quiet and they would just want to sit over in the corner and just watch us for a while but of course we'd invite them join them at the table um, you can have a little snack with us right so you know Patty was just talking to us about um, how his, his kitten scratched his face Patty that must have been pretty scary for you how did it feel and then we'd have these nice little pleasant conversations but the nice thing is that children could come in, they could play immediately. They could play with whatever they wanted. You know, there's some rooms that would be closed yet. But they had a whole play area, the whole, whole room to play in, to choose whatever they want. They could sit with us and chat. They could sit with us and just look. But it was all on their level. And it really set a nice tone for that human connection, I think. Just really a nice way to to um, set up conversations and just getting to know each other and that's the key that I'm really really trying to promote for everything we're talking about even though it's brain development that we're talking about here so I'll come back to that idea and those that that those stories in just a minute but I want to move ahead to a specific topic um, sorry, I should have had this slide going. That's my little slide saying we did porridge and uh, biscuits, of course. Let me jump ahead. Brain development is, of course, a huge topic, and, and stress is a very specific topic within it. But I wanted to bring it up because it's very relevant to the world we're living in to today. And the simple message that I want to get across here, and you can read more about this in Science of ECD, for example, is that a lot of stress or ongoing stress can be harmful to children's long-term development. The good news is that when children have supportive adult relationships, it can really reduce any of that potential harm. So even if I flip back to our story about sitting around having biscuits or porridge or any kind of little chat or, or snack or lunch opportunity like that, just having that opportunity to talk and get to know each other and support each other is a really positive way to reduce any potential harm from stress. So keep that as, a, as an, an aside, as a key point as well that there are so many benefits to building these relationships and making human contact top of your priority. So the big question, why it matters, and quite simply, just that early years uh, experiences have a long-term impact and very powerful impact on the developing brain and the life course of children. That means that what is happening in these early years, because of this explosion in brain development, has a, a, a very powerful effect, and not just for who they are now, but their health and, and positive or negative outcomes throughout life in, in the long term. 
And that's true not just for the individual, but all the individuals together. So our society is better off when early, um, when young children have uh, positive experiences to support positive brain development. And let me just, I'll just put this um, graphic and, and don't worry about trying to catch, um, gather everything right away. It, it will loop. But what it's showing is the, the periods when sensitive periods occur in brain development. And that means the periods when the experiences that children go through have the most significant or the strongest effect. So if you see at the bottom, we've got ages from about birth to eight years old and uh, suiting uh, or matching the poll results fairly well, you can see that those earliest years between 0, 3, 0, 5, and, you know, it, it goes up, of course, not as strong, but in later years as well, that these earliest years are when what we do or what we um, help children to experience have the most impact. So if you take language, for example, the language skills that children are going to develop at these earliest ages are going to have um, the strongest impact. In other words, the better their language uh, development or experience at these early ages, the better it's going to be long term. Similarly with things like um, uh, vision, of course. Let's see, these very early ages here, any any uh, experiences that children have are going to have more powerful experience on their brain development than later on in life. And that doesn't mean that you don't get any benefit from experiences later in life. It just means that they're going to be more effective, more influential, more powerful in these more sensitive periods. And you can see these periods, sensitive periods are taking place during the early years. Here's a bit of a, a negative example, but it, it gets the point across. Um, probably most of you are familiar with the, the idea of the um, Romanian orphans from probably around the 90s when there was a, a huge number of young orphan babies, orphan children in Romania during the Ceausescu regime. And the orphanages were just totally overwhelmed to a point where these poor babies were pretty much just left in their cribs with no one talking to them, no one holding them, and no one stimulating them whatsoever, except for basic care. So feeding, changing, and, and things like that. So this scan is just showing brain activity. And a normal child would be a child who does get held, does get talked to does get played with, does get to hold a teddy bear, does get to move around, does get to explore. Whereas the, the Romanian orphan on the right would be from the background of basically no stimulation. So this graphic just really gets across the point that there's much less brain activity going on in here. So the brain were not stimulated in this period. And the question is, well, does that have long-term negative effects on the children who live like that? Well, if you look up Romanian orphans or Romanian orphanages or whatever the term you want to use, um, you're going to find a lot of a, a lot of answers to that question. You can also see more in science of ECD as well. So it, it's not a happy story, and and it, it's. Certainly not all children are going to be suffering to this extent, but it does remind us that the brain is going through this rapid development and stimulation is, is needed to support that brain development. So just go into a little bit more detail about what this period is all about. So again, we're talking about a period of rapid brain development during these early years that pretty much everybody identifies as the, the key period for these sensitive periods and significance. So here is, break it down nice and simply, is, is a couple neurons. Neurons are brain cells, and we're not going to get too much into the science, but the brain has, when it's born, about 100 billion cells. 
And uh, a really nice way to look at this is we have about as many brain cells as there are stars in our galaxy. So if this is a really good way to um, picture or imagine what's happening or what the brain might, you know, the, the, the magnitude of, of the brain and what's occurring, just picture a, a dark night with a, a clear sky and just full of stars. And then you realize that you, you don't actually see all the stars that are out there. You're only seeing part of them. But you look up and think that's the magnitude and the complexity of the human brain. And every time that the child will experience something, that there is connections being made between those brain cells. And the brains are being refined and they're being um, advanced. And we'll, we'll come back to that in a minute. But you'll see the, the points of contact image there. Those are the, the synapses. This is where those connections are made. And so we're going to talk about uh, synaptic density in just a moment or two. But again, just think of a, a starry sky and think of all of those stars plus more. That gives you an idea of what the human brain is in terms of numbers of brain cells. So this one fairly quickly. It's, it's pretty straightforward, I think. If you just notice between the age of um, just from birth to about five, six years, the brain goes from 25% of its weight to 90% of its weight. So just a huge amount of, of physical growth is taking place during that period. And here we come back to this idea of the, the synaptic density. And I, this is a, a key one for me. So what it's showing is at birth, uh, and this, these are approximations, they're just to get the idea across in your head. At birth, even though we, we all have the same amount of um, brain cells, those 100 billion brain cells, it's the connections that are, are really quite key. So at birth, there are certainly connections between the brain cells, but they, there's not as many as will come later on. So see how many connections, see how much synaptic density, that's the connections that come from experience by age six. And then you see at 14, there's actually less, and it's the same as adulthood. And what's happening there is that every time a child experiences some stimuli, some event, some experience, the brain is processing that information. So it's making connections, one brain cell to another, to another, to another. And those connections that get used get, tend to get strengthened and become more efficient. And those that aren't used get pruned away or sculpted away, we, the, our terms that people use. So the brain is actually getting much more efficient as well as making those connections. And that's a lot of that is happening in these very, very early ages of life. So what can be done, and again, from my fairly simplistic perspective i'm going to promote i'm going to suggest two things one the topic of last week's webinar which is promoting play and the second is just being there so making connections with them building relations with children talking with children um, singing with children reading books with children all these things this is what we need to do to build and support these connections and the refinement of children's brains so very quickly, because this, this was last week's, um, play, especially child-initiated play, child-controlled play, is such a valuable thing for children's growing brains. And it's also very valuable for them dealing with the stresses that they're dealing with today. So give them the time to play, the opportunity to play, lots of choice, lots of open-ended materials that they can come up with creative uh, ideas by themselves and be there with them. So observe them and talk with them and play along with them as much as uh, um, acceptable or appropriate for you to do. So play is, if you're looking to support children's healthy brain development, number one, play is where I would recommend you go. The second one, or the second component is that being there part. 
So it's, it's building the relationships. It's, it's the observations. Uh, just getting to know the children. What are they interested in? What are they playing? Why might they be playing? Talking with them, conversations, reading, eating, singing along, all that kind of stuff. Now, I'm just going to briefly, if you don't mind, I'm going to take off the, the um, sharing, stop sharing. There we go. And if, you, if people in chat, if you just want to give me a few keywords or phrases of other ways that you can build these relationships. So when we talk about relationships and human connection and uh, being with children and getting to know children, what are some ways? I've mentioned a few. If you can jump in with some of those. Empathy, there we go. Here's some observation, trust, active listening, beautiful. Following the children's leads and interests for sure. I love the laughing. Um, you know, I'm the same thing for whether you're a baby who laughed just beautifully or adult education. When I hear laughter, I know it's a good place and there's good learning going on. Experiential play, having fun, music, of course, and singing. You'll never, you'll never have me talk about early childhood education ever without saying, "Sing, sing, sing, sing." It's so good for language development. It's so good for these relationships, and it's free and it's a beautiful thing. Open-ended questions, singing, dancing. So then we're getting into not just the the cognitive or the you know the the ideas, but the physical. There's smart guy words for that too, but we're moving on here. Being outdoors, yeah, we really stress the outdoor play. So tons of these, keep them coming. I'm just gonna have to go back just for lack of time, because I got my little um, my little timer here's running out. So I'm I'm just wanna make sure I I cover everything that needs to be covered. But I appreciate those are exactly the types of things that I'm talking about. So we're all on the same page about how these types of connections or, or, or um, how to make these kinds of connections and the types of things that they are. So let me just finish up or, or um, go in a slightly different direction with what are the children getting out of some of these experiences and what's happening in their brain. So again, picture that big starry sky and all those billions of brain cells. And so every time a child hears something, feels something, thinks about something, there are these electrical pulses that are going through the brain, making connections through the brain cells, through the synapses, and those connections that get made and used again and again are getting strengthened and more efficient. And the ones that aren't being used are being pruned away. So obviously we want to promote stimuli. We want to promote stimulation in the brain. So just a little exercise here. If this were presented in front of you or a child, what are some of the, the stimuli? What are some of the things, the concepts that come to your head that are literally going on in your head? And for this, I'll just shoot out uh, a few quickly here. Well, red comes to mind. Ball, round, words, white, black, shapes, letters. Each and everything I've just said there represents a surge of activity in my brain. And I picture out that big shiny, or not shiny, but the, the sparkly night sky and pretend that those are children's synapses and just imagine, in my mind, it's like lightning flashing from um, star to star. And I know that doesn't work very well because you typically you don't get lightning flashing on a starry night. But that's how I kind of picture the connections between the brain cells, the neurons, as children's brains process these types of things. But let me go to this next one here. Now think about the concepts. So if before I, I shot off maybe a dozen concepts, now put a child in this position and think of some of the things that they might be seeing, some of the things they might be experiencing. How do you describe the shape? It's not as simple as round. There are all kinds of shapes in here. The colors, it's not a simple, oh, this is red or brown or black or white. 
much more complex. So it's demanding much more, much more um, brain connections, much more uh, activity in the brain, just because of the complexity of it. Now put yourself not looking at a picture, but put yourself in that position. So the child's looking at the the child's here. So now the child can feel the temperature. Well, the brain deals with that as well. The child sees the tree, wants to, can I touch the tree? What does the texture feel like? Why is it cut there? Can I climb on top? How will my mom or my caregiver react when I climb on this? Is this burnt? How does my caregiver react when I touch the burnt part of the tree? What are those little strings? Can I touch them? Can I pick this up? And think of just the almost infinite number of concepts that are taking just from this normal day-to-day -day common activity, which is, in my case, it would be just going out, walk in the backyard and looking at something. And one more thing I want to get across, a specific uh, concept, and then I'll kind of wrap it up. This is the idea of serve and return. And it's a back and forth uh, approach to interactions with children. And a really good example of that is, is somebody with a young baby. So a baby might do a little bit of a coo or a babble. And then the mom or whoever's holding the baby looks at the baby and says, oh, you're talking to me, and then pauses. And then the baby does another response. So the idea is the serve would be the child babbling, and the return would be what you give back. And then it goes back and forth, almost like a, a tennis game or, or a, a volleyball game. And it's such a healthy way to look at how you can communicate with children and really support their brain development. And this is great for babies, but it goes all through childhood. Just this idea of observing them, following their lead, responding back to them. They will come back to you, back and forth, back and forth. And it takes observation and it takes being there with children. Uh, before I go into that, I just want to wrap up, get back to the idea of that, the human contact and just having a nice, healthy human relationship as your guideline or your guidance or your the perspective that drives you in terms of supporting early brain development. So when we were sitting around our little snack table eating porridge or, or eating the uh, biscuits that we made and some of the children actually made the biscuits and they, they, they needed the dough and they did all that and they tasted the ingredients and we were chatting about Patty and his kitten and that makes other people think of their cats, their their pets, and then we have those conversations. And think for every single one of those tiny little slices of experience that children have, there is tons of connections being made within the brain. So it's not as though when we talk about, oh, it's important to stimulate the brain during this important early years period. So we have to, oh, we'd better, I don't know, again, use some flashcards or some computer program that we have to use and we have to constantly be overloading them with information. You know, the chances there that you're just going to turn children off and be a little bit overstimulating. But just by normal, healthy human interactions, communication, conversations, um, playing along with children, we are doing tons of stimulation for their brains. And we're doing it on a nice, supportive level that's meeting so many other of their needs, including dealing with things like stress. Now, I think I pushed my time a little, so I'll click here. And just um, a reminder, I'll, I'll do some links to follow up on some of the things I talked about that you can look a little bit deeper. And you can certainly contact me at my email down to the bottom right. But I, I hope that I've got across the, the two points that I want to. One, that these early years are crucial in terms of brain development. And secondly, we don't need to panic over that to support children to the best way we can to support the early brain development. All we have to do is 
be there with them and be human with them and make connections. Let them play and we're all going to be just fine. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, if you would like um, information on similar topics or this topic, please do visit our website, which you just saw on the last slide, uh, for the Child Encyclopedia, for Families Canada, or for the Science of ECD. Uh, Isabel, any thoughts on the presentation? Anything to add uh, before we move? Well, well, thank you. It was, uh, and I saw the the, uh, the chat room there, it was clear, precise, and those key messages, even though we are in a special time where uh, we're wondering what's happening with stimulation, you bring that back to the relationship and all the, all that there, the stimulation happens through those relationships. And so it brings, you know, the idea of being there in support to, to parents. So thank you. And I, I would open up uh, the question uh, right now. And I'd like to invite uh, Families Canada CEO, Kelly Stone, to open the discussion. Hi, Kelly. Hi, hi. And uh, thanks to Isabel uh, for, for this whole series, for hosting it, and Brian for, for standing in for two now. And you can just see um, how you really struck a nerve on this one by the, <laughs> the busy chat line and all of the people that are responding to you. It's, it's been fun to, uh, to watch. Um, my question is really about um, mitigating the, the negative impacts um, that, that may affect children who've lacked access to uh, quality early learning experiences like like the Romanian children that you were talking about in the orphanages and and you know it's obviously going to impact their their long term quality of life and and potentially success in life. What do we do for those children? I mean, what how much opportunity is there to reanimate those uh, brain connections with the brain pliability? Have we have we missed opportunity there entirely? Well, I don't want to get into too much detail only because I don't want to um, misrepresent any factual information. I tend to be um, on the the huggy, cheerful, let's sing and have good times with children type of development uh, situation uh, or approach. Nonetheless, and, and I, I would direct anybody who's uh, interested, the science of ECD is a really good uh, place to look for more information on this plus there's tons of stuff online but I think the answer is a little bit of, of both in terms of has the boat sailed is it a little bit too late well we know on a certain level yes that there is long-term damage that is done when children do not get this stimulation at an early age and and this warm caring stimulation but the other hand, I would say the Romanian orphanage uh, situation or example is a much more extreme one. And so I, I, I don't want anyone to think that, especially I, I, anything to avoid parental guilt. If, if you, I didn't do a good enough job uh, with ch my, my, my children when they're little, I didn't sing to them, I didn't talk to them enough, I didn't do any of this. Well, the chances of you, you may not have provided the optimal environment, but none of us do, is, is not so much to worry about. The, but to your question, I think, well, what should we do? And what I would suggest is we can't control what's happened in the past, but we can control what we do now. And there's always room for humanity. There's always room for for making connections and, and building relationships and those will always have positive outcomes so looking at that idea of sensitive periods well we know that the effects on children's brains are much more powerful at the earliest ages and if we don't have those positive effects at those earliest periods it's going to be harder at least to make up for it later on but that doesn't mean we don't do our very best. So some children are just going to take a little more of our attention and they're going to take a little more of our patience and a little bit more of our love. So the answer is, yeah, it's, there can be a little bit of a, if you didn't get acceptable care at an early age, that it can have some pretty nasty effects. But 
the range of what children need in terms of what is good healthy care uh, is pretty broad because children are pretty resilient. And I, I just finish up with my final message or my to repeat my key messages. We do our best and we do it by talking and loving and communicating and playing with children. If we do that, we don't have to worry about what we're doing with and to children. Hopefully that yeah. gives something of value to you. It's a <laughs> tough one. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And some of the uh, comments and questions that's coming up in the chat also, to, uh, you know, speaks to how complicated this topic is, but how important. And uh, some of, uh, if I could summarize some of the questions that are coming, uh, it's in the context of what we are facing today, the pandemic, of course. Uh, so in your opinion, uh, in your knowledge, what could be possible effects of social isolation on brain development in early years? And what can people do when kids start coming back if they have maybe missed some period of uh, stimulation during this time of uh, confinement? Right. Well, one thing I'd really like to highlight about what we can do is when, when children come back or, uh, you know, when, especially if, for those of us who, who would work in daycare or um, uh, situations like that, is trying to think in terms of you know if if we're expected to do less physical contact if we're supposed to be less uh, if there's supposed to be less touch for example and we have to physically distance ourselves more then we have to go even harder stronger and more focused on other ways to make those connections so we, we can't be sitting behind a desk. We can't be sitting in a corner cutting out um, bunnies that we're going to glue, you know, fuzzy stuff on. We need to really make sure our time with children is focusing on those human connections. And so let's do a lot of talking. Let's do a lot of singing. Let's go for a walk and, and, and chat about what there is, you know, out to see and, and just things to think about. I don't, I'm not very concerned that children are going to be suffering any long-term brain uh, defects because of a few months of not getting optimal play experiences. Um, that would be much, you know, much deeper, much longer would be, uh, problems would be required for that. But I think let's do our very best to make uh, humanity and relationships our driving force when it comes to whatever planning we, we're doing with children, whatever experiences we have in mind with children, let's make sure that we can provide ourselves to be there with them uh, as much as possible and not let the, the restrictions of the pandemic run everything, if you know what I mean. You did mention uh, stimulation during early years as an important aspect of brain development. Uh, but how much stimulation is enough stimulation, and and how can we avoid overstimulation? Yeah, I, I think the the safest way and and the most natural way for us is just to uh, approach it with being natural, caring human beings. So remember that stimulation comes from all experiences. So when you're sitting with on a rocking chair and you got a, a little one or a couple on your lap and you're reading a story and you're going back and forth and just reading that, that book and maybe a little, little sing song um, tune that goes with it. You just, you just have to keep in mind that that is a lot of stimulation for the brain. That is the kind of stuff that's building those connections in the brain. It doesn't, you don't need to be trying to explain the difference between a spider and an arachnid, for example, but you just need to have good, healthy, diverse experiences with play. And I think as long as you're approaching it from this human communication or contact level, you're not likely to overstimulate because most of us pick up pretty quickly when somebody doesn't want us in their space. They give us that body language that says, hey, not now, or I've had enough. So if, if our idea is to support development by talking with children, playing with children, reading, singing with, 
with children. It, it's good for us. It's fun for us. It's relaxing for us. And it's also good for them. But if our idea is about stimulating, oh, okay, we need to know about color and we need to know about shapes and we need to know about, you know, world capitals or whatever you may want to, you think the children need for stimulation, and you try to make them all come together and sit in a circle and listen, then the stimulation could very well be too much and they're just not interested and they're not getting anything from it. And what you're doing is you're raising the stress for them when you don't want to raise the stress. So stimulation that's provided naturally on a human level in a stress-free environment, that's the sweet spot. That's the perfect way to promote healthy brain development. I was just thinking and I saw some uh, um, information coming from the chat room about, you know, uh, there are situations where we are worried about children in, you know, with the neglect uh, maybe happening. And right now I just wanted to highlight that as, We, you were saying we don't really know what, uh, the impact and when we call the stress becoming toxic it, it's when you know it's very intense and you know duration is there and there's no support and right now we don't know but of, I I am um, I just I'm thinking that our responsibility is uh, to make sure that we know those resources we can suggest parents to go to. This is one of the only thing we can really do, you know, share the information, make, make sure we have access to that repertory of services of, you know, all kind of aids that parents may have. Um, but also it's about connecting and trying things and being uh, creative about new ways. There's no recipe there. And um, I guess it's uh, trying things and we all worry about children. But again, um, we have to be indulgent with ourselves as educators and service providers also, but have that responsibility to try uh, to share information and to connect because it's all about connection, Brian said it so nicely. Thank you. So that really brings us to the end of the final episode in our six-week series. Thank you so much, Brian, for um, your guest um, presentations these last two episodes and Isabel for uh, facilitating this series. Uh, we hope that uh, it was useful to all our participants. Please visit our website to access more resources that could be useful to you at uh, Families Canada, at the Child Encyclopedia and uh, Science of ECD. And uh, don't forget to check the magazine in your Dropbox. Uh, it's a magazine we put together under the Science to Practice project, uh, uh, under this partnership with, between Families Canada and the Centre of Excellence on ECD. Thank you so much again. It's been a great six weeks with you. Stay safe and thank you everybody. <laughs>